Hello everyone, welcome to our class expert talks. My name is Laura and today we're going to have another talk with one of our instructors. The word crisis can mean many things, both small and big, but they always have a considerable effect on individuals, organizations and even countries. But we shouldn't be that scared of coming across these messes as long as we're prepared. Successfully resolving a crisis can increase one's capacity to cope with future accidents. Therefore, it is extremely important to be ready for these tough situations and manage people around you to collectively overcome it. Today, we're going to explore how to prepare for a crisis, how to manage it, and what it means for an organization to go through it. And to help me with that, I've got instructor Hector Sandoval joining us. So, hi Hector, I'm glad to have you back. Hello, Laura. It's great to see you again, and I look forward to our conversation today. Absolutely. So we've already covered your past experience in aviation in our previous expert talk. So today we're going to get a bit more deeper into situations and kind of explore your experience in this particular accident that you've got. But of course, we're going to talk about your new course which is on crisis management. But just before we begin that, I just wanted to ask, you know, we had a conversation some time ago now, so uh, has anything changed with your work life, especially has it come back to normal? Thank you, Laura. Well, uh, since we last talked, I have been able to contribute two more courses to AeroClass, which has made me very happy. The last one, which is the one we're going to be talking about today on crisis leadership was uh, done finalized in September. So since then, I have started to prepare some outlines for future courses. And I'm really excited about the opportunity to work with AeroClass and some expansion of their products and services. So I will leave that for further conversations in the near future. Um, I got to say that while we see a lot of recovery in the aviation sector as a whole, there are still some services, in particular the ones that I was very much involved in delivering, which is in-person training to airports, airlines, and the rest of the stakeholders of the aviation community, which are still quite not up to the levels of the uh, pre-COVID uh, situation. So while that is still uh, something that we look forward for a recovery, I hope by early next year, an alternative platform such as AeroClass is really taking off. As you well know, we have a lot of activity in your company with your colleagues and departments. So I am actually quite pleased that uh, we have this alternative and this option for the aviation community to give them a quality learning and development product. Absolutely, sure thing. And uh, as you mentioned, you kept busy with uh, with courses at AeroClass and you've already recorded three. And I want to ask you, you know, as someone who is most experienced now, not having an audience, is it liberating or a bit confusing? <laughs> That's a great question. I have to say that the, in the beginning, I was a little bit um, concerned that maybe my uh, delivery was going to be somewhat compromised by not having an in-person audience, which is what I was used to. Uh, so if we look at the evolution from the first to the last course, I actually was able to gain more confidence in that delivery format. And by the last time that we had the um, recording in the studio, you know, we had a lot of material to go through and we went uh, on a record time frame to finish everything that we had to record with very minimal interruptions and very minimal distractions. So I was very pleased at that. So I enjoy very much delivering in this format because I know what the intent is, what the objectives are, and who the audience will be. A very wide global audience, which I hope we will be reaching very soon. So that is great. But on the other hand, call me old school and traditional, but I do miss having the face-to-face -face contact. So as long as we can come up with some alternatives to blend maybe those uh, different opportunities, I think that we have uh, a great, uh, you know, work and uh, chance ahead of us. Yeah, and I guess by the end of, you know, your next courses, you'll be the master of kind of filming course <laughs> in this situation, because obviously that does require some, you know, self-awareness as well, because you don't have any feedback to you, do you, when you kind of deliver your course? 
Exactly. I mean, you kind of are seeing yourself through the um, reflection of the teleprompter. But I have to say that in all of the recordings, we always have had the support from the production staff at Error Class, as well as from the local studio. The head of the local studio has also been extremely supportive and very, very good at giving me you know, great tips and great advice. So like I said, by the time that we went into the third course, it just went so smooth, so much faster, and again, almost without a hitch. So I am very grateful for having learned that skill. Well, I'm glad to hear that. So please introduce your third course to us, to everyone watching. What is it about? And as always, you know, who could mostly benefit from it? Sure. Well, if you look at the uh, three courses that I have been given the opportunity to contribute to our class, they all have a connectivity around the concept of leadership effectiveness. The first course was about the importance of great exceptional communication skills for leaders and managers. The second course dealt with how do we deal with change, focusing on people before we go into the processes and the methodologies, which is something that I have been observing most organizations tend to do. They look for the solution and they look for the framework, but they forget that when we are adopting change, those most effective, if they are not feeling involved right from the beginning, they will resist and maybe even you know, derail that potential change. And the third course, which is the one that we're going to be addressing today, deals with how do leaders show up to effectively take teams and processes and a wide array of stakeholders and activities under the pressures of crisis. So it's a crisis leadership focused course in which I had some experience in the airline business that I've been uh, working for almost uninterruptedly for the last 30 years by being part of teams that intervened and responded to, to three specific airline accidents. Um, all of them major airline accidents, all of them with a heavy loss of life and injuries uh, to passengers and to employees. So very serious um, events that I think have some lessons that we can share for leaders and managers to then incorporate into the activities that they are doing. We don't need to go to the extremes of an airline accident to adopt these best practices. And you know, the fact of the matter is, like we said in the other conversation, change is something that is happening now so fast, so exponentially, it's, it's affecting all of our activities in personal and professional life. And I think that with rapid change also, we are observing the emergence ever more frequently of crisis events. We've been living through a pandemic. We lived through a financial global meltdown. We're seeing a lot of changes and a lot of disruption caused by the climate crisis. So the word crisis is now also like the word change, part of our everyday landscape. And in organizations, whether they are aviation related or not, I suspect that those called to lead and manage the teams of the organization as a whole are facing crisis events more frequently, more deeply than ever. So we want to support them and help them and give them some inspiration from these events that we had a chance to be part of. And I did uh, get a chance to watch your course and kind of go through it myself. And I did get a feeling that it's quite personal to you, this course, because obviously you use your own personal examples. Is that the case? Was this very much based on your own personal experiences? Absolutely, Laura. And you know, let me just go back from a background perspective. Um, I joined the aviation business when I was 20 years old. Uh, as a check-in agent, as a passenger service agent for uh, back then Pan American World Airlines. And at the time that I joined the company, all that I was thinking about was the glamour of air travel. It was like this fascination that I had with the airplanes and the ability to go to far away exotic destinations. And by the work that I was doing, just encountering these passengers and looking at their passports and all the stamps and tagging their bags to far away places. So that was the kind of magnetism that the industry had with me. I never really thought about the risk and the consequences side of it. I mean, I knew that airline accidents happen, 
but you never think that this is something that is going to touch something that is close to you. So back in 1989, I was an employee of Pan American World Airways when the tragic bombing of Pan Am 103 took place over the Scottish airspace. This was a Boeing 747 that had taken off from London Heathrow en route to New York close to the uh, New Year Eve, so it was on the 29th of December. It was not a fully loaded uh, plane, but it had quite over 200 people. And there was a bomb that was planted in one of the suitcases that was loaded in one of the um, uh, previous uh, uh, layovers of the flight. And it went off, as we uh, all know, over Scottish airspace at basically cruise altitude. So that is like a very, very traumatic, tragic event. Everybody got killed, including people on the ground. And then I was on duty that afternoon back in my home station in Guatemala when we started to get information that this airplane had been lost, that there was speculation on the causes, and that unfortunately, as we all feared and then it got confirmed, everybody was lost. So that was my first experience with an accident of a major magnitude. And there's quite a lot of other issues that came to play that day, but it really caused a tremendous impression on me. Fast forward to a few more years. And when I joined United Airlines, I was trained to be part of the company's uh, special assistance team that was focusing on potential family members of victims of airline accidents. And again, You go about your job thinking that this is something that is not going to affect you or hopefully you're not going to be part of an airline accident response. But it did happen in 1996. Again, there was a domestic uh, aircraft involved in a heavy collision with a private aircraft in a U.S. domestic airport. And I was called to be part of the team that responded to that accident with a specific mission to assist families. And again, you gain the experience of being there on the site, meeting the families of those who were lost on the accident, and then basically unfolding all of the humanitarian response and all the procedures that we had lined up for them. Very intense work, um, very, um, it really humbles you to be so close to such a tragedy. And then in 2008, I was then a senior executive at Spanair, and on August the 20th of 2008, one of our aircraft, commercial passenger plane, an MD-82, taking off from Madrid's Barajas Airport en route to the Canary Islands, was also lost. It crashed shortly after attempting to take off for a number of technical reasons that we don't need to go into. But at that time, and this is completely coincidental, I was assigned be the crisis leader for the entire airline. So it was my responsibility to mobilize everybody in the company, senior executives, frontline employees, suppliers and partners to respond in all of the aspects, the technical part, the judicial part, and the most important part, which is the assistance to the families of the victims. And that accident, which carried 172 people on board, 154 people were killed and we had 18 survivors amongst them one employee one crew member so this is basically what i lived through for a number of days during the initial response and quite frankly up until my retirement from the company in 2012. since 2008 until i left the company i was always involved in some aspect of the response because this is another thing that we learned once an organization is affected by something as tragic as an airline accident, it really becomes part of the identity of the organization. And we still had some obligations and you know responsibilities towards those affected. So that's, in a nutshell, the degree of the experience that I wanted to share through some very specific takeaways in the course. And I hope that people will find that um, you know interesting, relevant, and actionable into what their particular organizational mandate is too. Yeah, I want to explore those uh, stories that you just mentioned. Uh, obviously, it's not something I think anyone likes to talk about, but I'm, I bet you know it's interesting because uh, we do not get you know to deal with these things that often, and right. you know, God forbid we ever do. But um, 
I just want to ask, let's kind of focus on the 2008 accident, just so we could okay. kind of have a, you know, touchdown there. Um, what goes through your head when, when you're a crisis director and you kind of learn that, you know, one of your aircraft just, you know, had an accident that this major? It's a great question, Laura. And I'll be very, very frank and very honest with you. The fact of the matter is, and this is also one of the sort of contextual elements of the course takeaways. You never arrive at a crisis at an ideal moment. That is to say that even if you plan and prepare and rehearse and you have all of the resources, systems, and human uh, capital elements in place to respond to a major crisis, when it happens, not everything is lined up perfectly. Not everybody can show up at their peak performance levels. And certainly that was the case for us at Spanair. We had already been dealing for the past two years from the beginning of 2006 till this summer of 2008 in a major restructuring process for the company that would have included the downsizing of the company by at least you know one fourth of the employee base that meant about a thousand employees would have to leave the company involuntarily because we needed to reduce the company's uh, cost structure and it was going to be a very difficult process to implement. It, it required many, many different projects and many different stakeholders to be uh, dealing with. So in the middle of this already critical process, we have the accident. Now, I have to say that in Spanair, since I joined the company back in 2000, we put a very specific emphasis on planning, preparing, training and creating a very robust infrastructure for such an event. That was basically one of my initial mandates in the company, even though I was not hired to do that. But because of my previous experiences, I was asked and I volunteered to help the company build from the ground up that kind of response, readiness, and you know all the systems and all the resources that went to it. It took us the better part of those eight years to put everything in place to the standards of any major well-reputed airline. And we had the benefit of being in a global alliance and being also audited and inspected by local, regional, and uh, international authorities to make sure that our systems, our plans, and our procedures were literally above the standard. So when this happened, to be honest with you, and this is one of those takeaway lessons also in the course, my initial reaction was to calmly proceed to the operations control center which is the source for the notification process for the entire company this is basically the brains of the entire airline operation the operations control center you have people that are responsible for flight operations ground operations cabin crew aircraft maintenance and a host of other responsibilities working together in the same room and they are monitoring literally on a real-time basis any and all operations aircraft and personnel that is involved in that particular moment so they got the official notification from the airport they contacted me i wanted to make sure that this was the right information and as soon as i got the confirmation i basically resorted to the training now we have been training preparing simulating and drilling for such an event by law we had to do this at least once a year and at spanair we try to do this at least twice a year with a lot of other intervals within those uh, 12 month segments of other specific training uh, programs this you know dedicated to specific response issues what i'm trying to say laura is that we were very well prepared to face an event like this nonetheless you have to remember that above all, it is a human tragedy with loss of life and lifetime injuries for those who survived and for all of their family and loved ones. This will be a moment that they will never forget. And this will be something that will change their lives forever. So with that knowledge that we were dealing with a major human tragedy element, we had to do our jobs and we had to unfold all of our plans and procedures. We had to mobilize all of our human resources 
we had to interact with all of the stakeholders that get involved in an event like this from a you know national perspective volunteer perspective uh and legal and regulatory perspective and just get on with the job but i have to admit that through the initial 10 days of the response of course as a human being you will be affected in different degrees and in different ways to the enormity and the gravity of the situation so i have to say i feel fortunate that my first reaction was to be calm and collected and to just start going after the facts assemble the initial crisis management team and start going through our processes with no delay so that we could literally start working for those that are most affected which are of course the victims and their loved ones absolutely and i guess as i said at the beginning once you're prepared for something like this, you can act much more calmer in the situation. But I still believe that um, it affects people because in your course, uh, even you say that one of the core management uh, things is to care for those most affected. And when we think about that and let's say early in accidents, we think about victims, their families and stuff like that. But we tend to forget that people who are behind the communication, the logistics organization, they're also affected by this tragedy. As you said, we're all only human. And when you see that much loss of life, you get affected. So, uh, you know, what do leaders of organizations can do to help their employees, you know, to go over kind of this strategy, you know, and help them in this situation? Yes, Laura, thank you. That's a great question. And as you very correctly say, I think the first thing that you need to realize is that traditionally, and again, referring to the airline emergency response planning philosophy, we always agreed that the survivors, as well as the people who lost their lives, and then their family groups and the expanded network of loved ones, those were the people that we immediately thought of as the most affected parties. So all of our resources, our planning, our preparation, and our services were geared to those individuals and those family groups. Now, what we also understood at Spanair, and again, based on the fact that I had been participating in other teams and other accidents, is that the people who respond also have to be considered as those affected because they will be going psychologically, emotionally, spiritually through more or less the same trauma perhaps not as directly as a person who loses a loved one, a direct relative, but you have to think about the fact that in most airlines, you have people who know the crews, the ground employees, and people who may actually be traveling as part of their travel benefits. You may also have friends, if not relatives, also involved in a major airline accident. And this is something that happened in the case of Spanair. So for example, our head of flight operations was deeply acquainted with the uh, captain and the first officer of that flight and some other flight operations members who were traveling as part of the passenger uh, uh, count in that airplane. So this is something that you have to realize. And what we did in Spanair is that we recognized that fact. So we established a provider of psychological support and counseling, a very professional well-prepared network of mass disaster trained psychologists and psychiatrists who were available to us through an agreement together with other sources like the red cross as well as the spain uh, national response in case of accidents and emergencies which includes a civil protection arm so within all that framework of responders and caregivers we established that we would give our employees and anybody who was involved in the response side to also have the availability of that sort of support, counseling, and where necessary, people would be um, taken off those responsibilities if we felt that that was affecting them, okay? Including myself. I mean, I had to go through psychological evaluations every second or third day to ensure that my uh, mental fitness as well as my physical fitness, we're capable to withstand the pressure and the long hours and all of that exposure to the human tragedy aspect that an airline accident involves. So 
we, we did that consciously and I have to say that it was a very good decision made well in advance of any accident, any emergencies. It was part of our planning and preparation. So this is something that we also include in the course as a recommendation, not to uh, disregard or put in a second category the caregivers, okay, uh, compared to those people that are most affected because they lost a relative on the accident. But it could be viewed as those two segments of uh, individuals and groups will go through more or less the same trauma, the same uh, emotional roller coaster. So you need to provide for both of them to have the availability of such support and, and counseling where necessary. Yeah, so in your course, uh, you also say that incorporating a crisis into an organization is, you know, very important. So I guess it all kind of goes under that, that once you're prepared for these things and you kind of get everything covered, you can overcome it, let's say easier than usually. But it's still difficult, isn't it? Absolutely, Laura. Now, let me put it in another perspective. Now, I've been involved in the aviation business for more than 30 years. This is what I have known professionally from an airline, an airport, a civil aviation, uh, and other kinds of services and, and providers uh, this is the, the kind of world that I've known. Now, in aviation, we know that things can happen, whether it's incidents, accidents, minor or major. There will always be external and internal factors that may cause a disruption to the planned events. As soon as you get hired in any aspect of aviation or airline operations, this is a fact that is ingrained in your training because you have to be able to respond to a disruption okay, in a planned, professional, and effective manner. You should not be surprised that you have a major weather event that cancels hundreds if not thousands of flights. You should not be surprised if a flight has to be diverted for medical reasons. You should not be caught um, unprepared if all of a sudden there's a major strike that affects all of your air traffic control operations in major regions of the world. So this is something that we know in the aviation world, especially if you are working closely to the operational side, okay? Now, if you look at other industries, financial services, pharmaceutical, um, other types of transportation, uh, distribution and retail, now, the level of disruption and the level of events that may cause you to go to deviate from your original plan of activities may not be as frequent or as intense as in the aviation world. So the preparedness and the mindset of people that work, especially in the leadership roles for all those other industries or sectors may not be as um, well absorbed or well incorporated into your mindset. But I remember there's a famous quote from an airline CEO, a major US airline CEO who was quoted as saying, airline management is crisis management 24 seven. And he was right from the perspective that if you look at an airline, you always have the potential of delays, cancellations, or very unexpected events that may cause you to have to redo your entire network, your entire schedule, and your entire um, deployment of aircraft, cabin crew, pilots, and technicians to carry out the mission of taking people from point A to point B. And as we saw in the last, you know, almost two years with the pandemic, um, sometimes you have to put together a very quick response plan to something that is happening in real time. And this is another thing that I would like to have people take back from the course that dealing with a crisis, in particular one where the core of your mission is to care for those most affected. Again, the people who lost their lives, any survivors, and the entire network of family, uh, relatives, and loved ones. You also have to understand that as a leader in a crisis, you have to act in a very rapid sequence of events you have to take a lot of major decisions without even having a chance to review them. So they have to be very well planned and prepared in advance. 
And you have to deal as a third layer of complexity with many stakeholders. Some are official, some are non-official, some are local, some are regional, some are international. And many of these stakeholders, in fact, none of these stakeholders will have worked together with each other before. Because an accident, fortunately, is something that happens with, you know, less and less frequency thanks to the fact that aviation has always uh, stood for safety as the number one priority and we continue to be air transportation the safest mode of transport available so accidents are far in between each other they don't happen as frequently as they did 30 40 years ago but when they happen you have to bring together hundreds if not thousands of people of different jurisdictions, of different nationalities, of different cultures and backgrounds together in the same place to do a number of rapid response activities without having had the opportunity of meeting and working with each other before. So you have to deal with many things at the same time as a leader. And that's why in this course, we also tell people that we have a cognitive bias towards thinking that if we have experienced people and very well skilled people, we should be able to come out all right from a crisis event. And that's what I believe too, until I had my exposure as the crisis leader for the Spanner Flight 1522 crash. And it took me many years of reflection and studying and conversing with other people who had similar experiences to come out with a third pillar that in addition to experience and knowledge or skills, you also have to come with this very, very good, excellent word that you came up in the beginning of our conversation, which is self-awareness. There's a lot that is involving the emotional intelligence framework that we have to also observe to be excellent crisis leaders. Because if you're not self-aware and you're not able to manage your emotional state with your rational state in a moment of high stress of high intense work and pressure then it's going to be very difficult to succeed even if you have a tremendous resume a lot of experience or you have very good skills to do work that in other circumstances may not be affected by the fact that we're dealing with all these multiple layers of complexity human tragedy Lots of work do, done under high pressure and with a high degree of quality that's expected. And the third layer, which is dealing with so many stakeholders that will only come to work together for this particular event. And after that, they may not even see each other ever again in their uh, entire professional history. And also, uh, you said something very interesting uh, just uh, previously that once something like uh, this accident happens, it kind of becomes a part of airline's identity in the future. And I guess, you know, talking about leaders, it becomes another issue for them, how to move on from that, how to even, how to keep the morale up for all the employees after something like that. So how does an organization move forward from this? Yeah, that's a great point, Laura. You have a, a very good point there. Um, well. This is again in the philosophy of aviation and specifically with an airline emergency response we do have that process incorporated into our plan our procedures our culture and all the activities that we do which is to say again you acknowledge that this event becomes part of your history and your identity but you also recognize that to be an effective service provider you have to also continue with the business. You know, you have to continue with the promise that you have made to your customers, your shareholders, your partners, and other um, entities that you collaborate with. So what we do is that we acknowledge and recognize and we remember, memorialize, and have continuous contact with those that are most affected, again, also in the context of an airline accident, should they wish to, because not everybody wants to continue. I'm talking about the families and the victims, but to the degree that you have, for example, anniversary uh, uh, memorials, 
and you have a special recognition for those people that you lost if you had employees on board which is always the cause with the pilots and the cabin crew and maybe some other um, uh, employees who were traveling as passengers and you do that to remember but you also do that as a way to process the grief and then move on there is a cycle of grief that we go through in this course as well as with the change management course which is the kubler ross grief cycle and it's a very well documented cycle that most people will go through under a mass trauma event and that is to say that first you have denial and then frustration and then anger but there is a process by which when you do debriefings and you have this counseling available and you do these memorial acts for the people that is part of the grief also being processed accepted and becoming part of your identity and then it allows you to move on so we did that in the, in the case of the span air flight and then every other uh, airline accident that i've been part of this is always part of the philosophy that you spend a very good amount of time doing your debriefing doing your counseling doing your grieving and then giving everybody a chance to express what they feel that experience has uh, represented for them on a personal, on a group, and a professional and organizational level. And you never forget, but you move on because you also have a promise to keep, services to deliver, and a product that you want to be standing by and proud of. So this is what we do. You know? We work through those issues and we use all of the best tools available uh, in the world of psychology, mass disaster, trauma relief, and other aspects of you know, human uh, care to be able to deliver that. And you said that airlines is just crisis management 24-7. So is it fair to say that once you kind of learn how to deal with those, it becomes easier? Or does it, does it kind of just keep going on and it's never the same and you can never be fully prepared for anything? Well, those are two very good points. Let me let me address them by saying the following. Um, on August the 20th of 2008, I was one of seven company directors that were listed in a roster for on-duty emergency directors on a weekly basis. Okay, We rotated once a week or, you know, seven days a, a week, uh, 24 hours, that responsibility in addition to our normal jobs. Okay. Now, we will never know how other people would have responded should they have been rostered to be the emergency director on duty for that day. What I can tell you is that my performance as I evaluated and others had some degree of effectiveness because of the fact that I had been exposed to two previous airline accidents. Now, in my company at that time, none of the other company directors none of the other managers none of the other executives had had that experience before now again by coincidence i was a director on duty so when i had that information on my phone confirming that there had been an accident and that i should proceed to the crisis management room and activate a response i really think that that previous experience allowed me to be able to carry out that initial uh, responsibility without too much time spent you know thinking about the tragedy the loss of life and all the emotional impact that was going to have I did have an emotional impact which was basically managed through the initial response of 10 days and I had that counseling available to me but at least I remembered that for the first 24 hours which tend to be the most critical because this is where all of the basic initial response activities need to be delivered. And this is how quickly you are going to be judged by the public opinion, the media, as well as those affected, if you are being effective in your response. And by effective, I mean caring, compassionate, as well as professional, dignified, as well as being time sensitive, as well as being able to respond to any and all needs. You have to be able to do that very well. And uh, again, I think that, yes, having the previous experience in two other accidents, plus having been involved in a very significant part of my career, 
directly in the operational side of the business. That is airports, aircraft, cabin crew, and some other aspects that are very dynamic. I think that gave me the opportunity to have, you know, the background and the experience and the know-how to be able to respond to a crisis in a methodical, logical, calm and collected manner, which, you know, I will never know if I had a different background, if I had a different level of experience, if I had, had responded differently. But I can tell you that we did <clears throat> witness uh, people that, not, that did not have that level of experience or did not have that background of dealing with major crises responding differently to those events. And by different, I mean they were not able to be part of the crisis management team because it was too overwhelming. Now, those individuals were very effective in helping us to do business continuity and to keep the airline running for the amount of time that some of us had to be involved only with the crisis event. Uh, but it did, you know, basically prove this point that if you have experience, training and preparation and you've been exposed to this as, as terrible as it is, it will give you a different advantage towards responding and taking those decisions that those individuals who have not. Absolutely. So I guess kind of it all comes down to the fact that if you have experience, it will be easier for you to overcome crisis. And if you don't want to have your own experience, I invite everyone to learn from Hector's experience in his uh, course on crisis leadership at ironclass.org. So I want to thank you, Hector, uh, for joining me. As always, it's a pleasure with you. And um, thanks for sharing your experience because I'm sure uh, a lot of people will appreciate this. Well, thank you very much for having me on your podcast, Laura. I really enjoy talking to you. And I also look forward to having our customers and our users experience this course and uh, look forward to engaging with them in whatever ways the platform will allow us to have contact. Uh, because I think it is a very relevant aspect of leadership that needs to be addressed in the times that we are living in. And I think that, if anything, rapid change and all of these other events that we talked to that talked about in the beginning are really going to put pressure on individuals and organizations. So great crisis leadership skills are going to be very valuable for anyone and everyone involved in professional workplace activities. That's a wonderful way to wrap up our conversation. So thanks a lot for watching and take care. Thank you. Goodbye.